most of you know that uh, I like to hunt. I am I hunt by with archery, with a bow and arrow, and also with a firearm. And I like to, to shoot my bow. Uh, grew up shooting a compound bow, which is one that has the sights and the wheels and the pulleys and everything. But over the years, as I've gotten more and more into the older stuff, like the muzzle loaders and the historical reenactments, I, I decided I wanted to go back and, uh, and shoot a, a longbow. And so I, I purchased a couple of years ago a longbow, and, and I had a pic here, to, here's a good picture of me with my longbow. <laughs> That's probably more like it, but uh, but the thing about the longbow is, you know, like I said, the compound bow has sights. It's got some pins out there, and when you pull the, the string back, there's a, a little hole there called a peep that you can put on there, and so you line up the little pin through the little peep and put that on your target, and if you hold everything still, the, the arrow will go right where you want it to go. Uh, the longbow doesn't have any sides. It is literally a stick and a string. And I remember when I got my, my longbow and I, and I talked to people about, you know, how do you shoot this thing? They said, well, you pick your target, you pick the smallest thing on that target that you can focus on, and you just focus all of your attention and you make the arrow go there. It's like your brain just gets so intensely focused that it that it connects all the muscles and the sinews and the fibers and everything in your body just becomes so connected that your mind basically wills that arrow to go where you want it to go. Now I've got my bow and an apple and I was wondering if someone would be willing to test this theory. I'm just kidding. I, don't, I doubt we would get many takers because the reality is my focus is not nearly as intense as it ought to be. I, I don't know about you guys, but I can walk into a room and forget why I went to that room. Does that happen to any of you? Ever happen to any of you? Uh, my focus is not nearly as good as it ought to be. I get distracted real easily. Uh, I will be doing one thing and the next thing I know I'm doing something totally different that I never set out to do but I start on this well, then I see well this needs to be done and then oh there's that and there's that and sometimes I don't stay focused very well. Sometimes I get focused on the wrong thing. If any of you ever started a project and, and in the middle of it you get to doing instead of putting this together, you get to fixing this, and before long you spend all your time doing this when you really needed to do that in the first place. And, and sometimes we get distracted, we get focused on the wrong thing. And I don't think I'm the only one that's guilty of that. But what we need to understand is that we will never hit our target unless we learn to focus on our target. In the book of Galatians, and you can turn there with me, Galatians chapter 6, we're going to finish this up this morning, Galatians chapter 6, uh, beginning in verse 11, if you're using the Brown Pew Bible, this is on page 826, Paul had gone to the churches in Galatia and he had shared with them the gospel, the target, the most important thing. But there were people coming in trying to distract the believers, trying to get them focused on something different. And so this morning we're going to talk about the fact that you and I need to always be aware of where our focus is. And the text this morning gives us two reasons for watching our focus. The first is that wrong focus just misses the mark. If we're not focused on, on where we're wanting to hit, well, there's no way we're ever going to hit it. And what Paul deals with here in the book of Galatians is a focus on the externals of religion that miss the mark of the most important things about faith. And I want you to begin reading with me. Galatians chapter 6, verse 11. Paul says, See what large letters I use as I write to you with my own hand. 
to those who want to make a good impression outwardly are trying to comp compel you to be circumcised. The only reason they do this is to avoid being persecuted for the cross of Christ. Not even those who are, circ who are circumcised obey the law, yet they want you to be circumcised that they may boast about your flesh. And I want us to stop right there. Because Paul's closing of his letter here is more than just a formality. They've done a lot of research on ancient letter writings and, and letters were supposed to begin a certain way and they're supposed to conclude a certain way. And, and Paul's beginning the conclusion of his letter. But what we see is that Paul is still driving the point home. Paul wants them to understand that Galatians is a very unique letter because it starts very different. He starts basically by screaming at them, what has bewitched you guys? What on earth happened to you guys? And he ends kind of at the same thing. I want you to see with what large letters I'm writing this with my own hand. It was very common for him to use a secretary. And then people could say, well, maybe this was the secretary's interpretation of what Paul meant. Paul wants the Galatians to understand that what I'm writing to you, this is me, Paul, writing this, my own hand, great big letters. So there's no question that what I'm telling you right now is of vital importance. And he goes on to say, those who are coming and trying to distract you and get you focused on other things, they do so because of one main reason, main reason, and that is self. It's a self-preservation thing for them. They want to avoid persecution. They're surrounded by other people who are pushing an agenda, and they want to fit in. It's not about truth with them. It's not about hitting the mark. It's just about fitting in. And they also want to be able to brag at the fact that they got you to fit in as well. They want everyone else to be able to, to look at them and say, wow, look how you've moved that entire church in the, in the, in the Galatian region. And so they, they do it out of self. But that focus on the external things, such as circumcision, misses the mark. And Paul has driven this home over and over again. Flip back into chapter 1. In chapter 1, beginning in verse 6, we're going to read through some of these places. Paul begins the letter saying, I am astonished that you're so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion. They're trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. They're trying to distract you and get your focus off what it ought to be. In verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let it be eternally condemned. As we have already said, and so I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of Christ. Paul begins the letter by saying it's not just about the externals. It's not just about pleasing men. It's about hitting the mark, what is the most important in the gospel of Christ. Over in chapter 2, beginning in verse 21... Uh, chapter 2, verse 21, Paul says, I did not set aside the grace of God, for if righteousness could be gained through the law, then Christ died for nothing. If there was something externally we could do to make ourselves righteous, then Christ died for nothing. And he goes on in chapter 3 and says, You foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you? Before your very eyes, Jesus Christ was clearly portrayed as crucified. I would like to learn just one thing from you. Did you receive the Spirit by observing the law, which is doing external things, or by believing what you heard? Are you so foolish after beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? Again, Paul's argument all along has been that it's not the external things we do, it's something more than that. 
down in verse 10 of chapter 3, all who rely on observing the law, the merely the external stuff, are under a curse. For it is written, cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So Paul's argument throughout the entire letter to the Galatians has been that if you just focus on the external keeping of the law, you're missing the mark. And church, we need to make sure that our focus is not just on the externals. This is a theme that runs throughout the whole Bible. I want you to just read through some of these with me. Exodus chapter 25, verse 1 and 2. The Lord said to Moses, Tell the Israelites to bring to me, bring me an offering. You are to receive the offering from, from, for me from each man whose heart prompts him to give. Now, I had never seen this really before until this week when I was looking at it. God doesn't say just, just any old gift is good, but it's the gift from the man whose heart has prompted him to give it. It's not just the external giving, but it's the internal heart that leads to that. Over here in the Deuteronomy chapter 5, the Lord heard you when you spoke to me, and the Lord said to me, I have heard what this people said to you. Everything they said was good. Oh, that their hearts would be inclined to fear me and keep all my commands always so that it might go with them, well with them and their children. Oh, that their hearts may be inclined. The people had just said, God, you're going to be our only God. We're not going to follow anyone but you. God said, that's awesome. If only their hearts were so inclined. It's not just about what we say, the externals, it's about the heart. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength. Notice he doesn't say, love the Lord your God with all of your external church going. With all your heart, soul, with all your strength. First Samuel chapter 16, verse 7 when they're picking their king. But the Lord said to Samuel, Do not consider his appearance or his height, for I have rejected him. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. This is exactly what Paul's dealing with in Galatians. It's the outward appearance that these people are pushing. God doesn't look at the outward appearance. And then here in Matthew, uh, I got ahead of myself. Matthew chapter 6, verse 5 through 7 says, When you pray, Jesus is speaking here, says, When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they will receive their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. And then your Father who sees what is done in secret will, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that it will be heard, that they will be heard because of their many words. It's not just external stuff. And finally, Romans chapter 2. Man is, a man is not a Jew if he is only one outwardly. Nor is circumcision merely outward and physical. No, a man is a Jew if he is one inwardly and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the Spirit, not by the written code. Such a man's praise is not from him, but from God. Everything is about the heart. And that's where the focus ought to be, not on the externals of religion, but on internals of religion. In church, we have often focused more on externals than we probably should have. We focused on external appearances, what people wear to church. Uh, we've, we've had you know, discussions here before. Some of you remember a time when, when it was uh, not allowed for women to wear pants to church. Sometimes men were not allowed to have hair that touched their collar. For some of us, that's becoming less and less of an issue. <laughs> there were times when Coats and ties were required in church. And we focused on those things. 
time when a young man would show up to church wearing an earring and be told he had to go home or take it out. Had a lady tell me the other day she remembers going to church and being told when they got to the door that they were not dressed appropriately, her family, and they needed to go home. Church, that's focusing on the wrong thing. We've also sometimes focused too much on outward actions. I want you to hear me out here because I don't want to be misunderstood in what I'm about to say. But sometimes we have put the cart before the horse and focused on the external actions of people before we focused on the true mark. We focused on, on baptism before we taught people about Jesus. We have focused on the ancient order of worship and the way we do things before we've taught people about Jesus. And we've, we've just, we need to understand, I'm not saying that these things aren't important, but those are a result of, of, our, of hitting the mark. It's not the way to hit the mark. We need to change the way we think about things. I haven't seen this movie yet, but I read about it the other day. Uh, in fact, I picked it up at the video store last night and started to rent it, but, but somebody said something that kind of discouraged me about it. But it's the movie Moneyball. How many of you have seen Moneyball? Is it a good movie? Okay, all right. Well, I'll have to get it then for sure. But, but I read this the other day, and this is what the movie is about. It's about the 2002 Oakland A's baseball team that, that finds itself in a bit of a bind. You see, the team had performed pretty well the previous year, making it to the playoffs, but in the offseason, three of their best players were kind of stolen away from them by other teams. They didn't have a lot of money, and, and now they need to rebuild the team, and so they're, they're trying to figure out how to rebuild a good team without a lot of money. And so the, the, lead, uh, the manager is a guy named Billy Bean, played by Brad Pitt, who stumbles upon a revolutionary strategy to turn the A's into winners. Now, Bean's breakthrough occurred, or breakthrough occurred through an, an assistant, a young guy named, a uh, Yale, Yale trained guy named Peter Brand. Now, Brand had this idea that if we set aside all the assumptions, the way we've done baseball in the past, the way we've recruited in the past, we can get a team together. And he starts with some questions. He said, how do you win baseball games? And the answer was, Scoring runs. Okay. For those of you that don't know baseball, Nadine will instruct you afterwards. Okay? So you win baseball games by scoring runs. How, how is it possible to score runs? Getting on base. There you go. And so he had this idea. Brad said, if we can get people that can get on base, we can win ball games. Now, previously, the way that they had recruited was by the look of the player. Players got to have that look. You've got to have that presence. You've got to be able to, to swing a certain way. You've got to be able to, to see that ball crack off of his bat in just the right way. You've got to be strong and powerful and all of this. Well, they call the recruiters in and says, we don't want you to recruit that way anymore. We want guys that can get on base. We want the guys who have a knack to get on base. It doesn't matter if they've got all of this other stuff. Well, of course, everybody says, well, that's crazy. That's not the way we do baseball. But you know what? It worked. Within a year or so, they had a team that was actually winning and doing well because they found if they focused on the right mark and not just the externals and not just how things looked, they actually accomplished their goal. Church, we need to learn to make sure that our focus is in the right place. Because if it's not in the right place, we're going to miss the mark. But right focus hits the mark. And we need to be focusing on what Paul says is the most important target, and that is the cross of Christ. Paul goes on in, in verse 14, and he says, May I never boast except in the cross of Christ. In fact, let, let me read it except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, through which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What counts is a new creation, peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, even to 
Israel, the Israel of God. And finally, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. The only boast for Christians, Paul says, because he's told the Galatians to follow his example, and he says that the only boast he has is the cross of Christ. What exactly does that mean? What does the cross of Christ entail? Well, Paul tells us some of it here. He says that, that here at the cross of Christ, or in the cross of Christ, is where the world is crucified to Christians. The world is about externals. It's about looks and appearances. And that is crucified to Christians. Not only that, Paul says, but here Christians have been crucified to the world. We don't live for the world anymore, Paul says. Sin is removed in the cross of Christ. Guilt is removed in the cross of Christ. Here in the cross of Christ, Christians are justified, declared innocent, even though they're guilty. Here, the Christian is set free from the law. Here in the cross of Christ, these things happen by God's grace and not by man's actions. Paul says that is the only thing I boast in. And when this mark is hit, when people understand that, Paul says, then a new creation is going to occur. And this wasn't something new for Paul. Paul didn't just pick, you know, hey, let's just talk about a new creation. This is something that all the early Biblical writers, all the disciples understood that's what the cross was about. In fact, I want you to turn with me to 1 Peter chapter 3. It's on page 857 in your pew Bible. 1 Peter, I'm sorry, 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 3. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 3, page 857. Peter says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in this last time. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ because in His great mercy He has given us Say it with me. New birth. Y'all didn't say that very well. Say it again. He's given us new, new birth. birth. Born again. Turn over into John chapter 1. The Gospel of John chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, page 750 in your pew Bible. John chapter 1, verse 10. Speaking of Jesus, John says, He was in the world, and though the world was made through Him, the world did not recognize Him. He came to that which was His own, but His own did not receive Him. Yet to all who received Him, to those who believe in His name, He gave the right to become children of God. Children, what's that next word? Born. Not of natural descent, nor of human decision, nor a husband's will, but born of God. Born again. New birth. New creation. Turn back into Galatians again and flip back over to chapter 3, beginning in verse 26 on page 825 in your pew Bible. Galatians chapter 3, beginning in verse 26. You are all sons of God through faith in, in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ have clothed yourselves with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male or female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. If you belong to Christ, then you are Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. What I'm saying is that as long as an heir is a child, he's no different from a slave, although he owns the whole estate. He is subject to guardians and trustees until the time set by His Father. So also, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent His Son, born of a woman, born under law, to redeem those under law, that we might receive the full rights of Son. Because you are sons, 
God sent His Spirit, the Spirit of His Son, into our hearts, and the Spirit who calls out, Abba, Father. So you are no longer a slave, but a son. And since you are a son, God has made you also an heir. You see, church, when people understand that in the cross of Christ there is new life and new creation, a change absolutely does occur. It's not an external change, but it's an internal change. Because just changing an outward appearance doesn't make us a new creation. Uh, most of you, uh, you know, you've seen these, these woolly caterpillars. Now we all know that a caterpillar really is just a butterfly in disguise, right? Okay? So you know if you take that caterpillar and you shave all the fuzz off of him, you, glow, you glue on some wings and antenna, you've got a butterfly, right? No? But, but you've taken what ought to be a butterfly and externally you've made it look like a butterfly, but it's not a butterfly. It's probably a dead caterpillar. <laughs> because we understand that the transformation from, from caterpillar to butterfly is an internal that produces an external change that becomes the butterfly. Not something that's done externally, but something that's done internally. And I think it's that same thing that happens when people focus on the cross of Christ and allow that to sink in. I think the change begins internally and then does become an external change. You know, our true boast, church, is on what Jesus Christ did on the cross. That should have gotten a resounding Amen. Our tr only true boast, the only thing I can boast in, the only thing you can boast in is what Jesus Christ did on the cross. I want you to let that sink in. Nothing you have done matters without what Jesus Christ did on the cross. And for years, we have focused on doing church right and a lot of the externals. And we need to share with people the cross of Jesus Christ because that is the only thing that can save them. And we need to emphasize that to the point where we have then a new creation. And when we hit that mark and that new creation comes about, then changes will take place. When people understand Jesus and all that He did for us on the cross, the change will happen and it will begin in the heart. These changes will then bring about some of the external changes that we look for. But they start from the inside. If, if you're changed on the inside, people will, be, will dress different. It, it really will happen. Because things become more important to them. And how they represent their Lord and Savior when they stand up here to serve the Lord's Supper will matter to them. There will be a conflict internally between the Budweiser t-shirt and serving on the Lord's Supper table. I can promise you it will happen. Because it happened to me. There were a lot of things in my life that I did that I didn't have any problem with at all until I came to understand that Jesus is my Lord. And that He died for me. He set me free. And He gave me new life. And now to stand and, and do the things that I used to do before Him bothered me. With people, you know, people that, that come to know who Christ is, they want to worship Him in spirit and in truth. And they'll seek for ways to, for that to happen. And they'll study the Scriptures. And they'll want to know that they're doing things that are pleasing to the God who died for them. The changes will take place, but they are internal changes. That is the mark that we ought to be aiming for, is giving people something that changes them and makes them into a new creation. Paul ends saying, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything. What matters or what counts is that new creation. Church, there are some of us here today that look okay on the outside. We've gotten real good at 
at dressing up, putting on the face, and externally, we're doing good. But we're not a new creation. What we do is we put on all the externals, we shave off the fuzz, we glue on the wings, we glue on the antenna, and we come through the door to, to let people know and let people see, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm here every Sunday. Aren't I good? Then we leave here and we go home and there's nothing new about us. We do everything that the world does. We participate in it. It doesn't change. And I'm talking about those of us who have been baptized and who have, who have been coming to church for a long time. And what God wants from us is a new creation. Then we we'll pretend. We're going to be talking in a couple of weeks when I get back from Memphis. We're going to do a four-part series called "A oh, Worship the King," and we're going to look at the kingdom of Jesus Christ and the rule and reign of that King in our life. Because, church, I am becoming more and more convinced all the time that we aren't living in the kingdom we ought to be living in. We're walking too often trying to keep one foot in each kingdom. And we need to really be thinking about this. We need to become a new creation. But I know there's also some of you here who have never even thought about this whole thing, about becoming a new creation. There are some of you here who have been stuck in the rut of life that you're in for so long that you've never even considered the possibility that there is a new life. A better life. Some of you have been so, have wallowed so deeply in sin. And I struggled with this for years thinking there is absolutely no way that God can ever wash me clean. The church, I'm telling you, He died on that cross to wipe out your sins. Just like He wiped out mine. And He wants to take you from where you've been and make you into a new creation. Brand new. To live with Him forever. That is the focus of the Gospel. And that is where our minds must be all the time. Jesus, keep me near the cross that's where my glory must be on. If that's not where your glory is this morning, it's time for you to come back to the cross. It's time for you to, to quit pretending and quit acting and doing all the externals, but to, to give your heart to God. And if you need to do that this morning, we invite you to come forward while we stand and sing this song.